Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship. In this message, we will cover Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 14, and take a close look at the signs in the skies that will take place very soon after the rapture during the Great Tribulation period. And now our study of Revelation chapter 6, verses 12 through 14, Signs in the Skies. Signs in the Skies. Uh, it's the sixth seal um, that deserves special attention uh, as it relates to a major sign of the end times, and that is signs in the skies. Now I want to say something before we get in here. Some of these signs that I believe we're going to, we are already observing and going to continue to see are just going to grow exponentially. But a lot of people will say, well, we're just seeing that because we've got the, you know, telescopes and we've got th satellites and everything. There's some truth to that. I mean, there's things we're seeing that we wouldn't have seen without those. Why, on what basis do we not accept the fact that that's part of the end times scenario? We would see things that normally we would not see because we have this technology. So, uh, you know, anybody says that, just kind of try to turn it around on them a little bit so they understand that the Bible didn't say that the signs would be, you know, the naked eye looking up from ground level. There'll be things that'll be seen in the skies that there's no contradiction if it's seen with a Hubble telescope or with Viking that's floating around out the end of the solar system. Um, all that plays into it. Uh, in verse 12 it said, I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And we talked about the earthquakes in our last study. And it says, And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And that's where we left off in our last study. Now, we mentioned that this is related to Joel's prediction that um, we later, actually we see quoted by Peter in Acts 2, um, that was not fulfilled in Acts 2. Peter said, this is that which Joel spoke of, but it wasn't fulfilled then. And anybody who you actually will hear teachers pretend that it was. It's, it wasn't. There, you, and we're going to see that actually. We're going to look at a few verses from Joel 2. Um, but this would happen at the uh, commencement of the Messianic kingdom during the day of the Lord. And that hasn't happened yet. The day of the Lord has not come yet. Believe it or not, there are teachers who teach that it has come. And we won't go into all that. We've talked about it before. And uh, it's a general and not exact correlation. In other words, Joel is giving a general overview prophecy of what's going to happen during the day of the Lord leading up to the kingdom. Um, unlike Revelation, which is a little more specific. But if you look at Joel chapter 2, go ahead and turn there. Keep your finger in Revelation 6. And let's look at Joel chapter 2. And uh, we're also going to see Jesus' comments on these things. And in Joel chapter 2, um, as you turn now, read verse 1, begins, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Uh, where is that? That's in Jerusalem. Um, that's the Temple Mount. Mount Moriah. There's going to be a temple there in the millennium. The king is going to sit on a throne there. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh. There's the context. The day of the Lord. For it is nigh at hand. Now he's, of course, looking into the future. He says, A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. This day of the Lord, I just want to mention this, could have potentially happened in, in Acts. That's right. The book of Acts as it yeah. was uh, unfolding there. Yeah. Constantly what you're hearing isn't the gospel of grace being preached, it's the gospel of the kingdom still being preached. Yep. Where Peter is saying, you crucified your Messiah. Repent and turn to Him. And if you do, you can have the kingdom. It's still there. That's right. The kingdom offer was still there. But one after the other, we see Paul saying, I go into the Gentiles. Yep. Because the Jews would not receive their Messiah. And so we went into this area that we know today as the church age. 
The church was established throughout the book of Acts and settled, and it's been in the parenthesis between the 69th and 70th week since then. That's where we are now. And uh, so that could have happened 2,000 years ago. If received by Israel nationally, Jesus would have um, raptured believers and handed over the apostate leaders to confirm the covenant, yep. which was predicted in Daniel 9.27, with Pontifex Maximus, who at that time was not called the Pope, he was the Caesar. That Pontifex Maximus title trans over, uh, transferred over to the Pope after Constantine. Um, and it, that would have happened in Rome back then, and for seven years that would have taken place. And then, Joel 2, uh, 28 and 29 would take place. Read verses 28 and 29 with me. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. That, uh, the, the beginnings of that actually started to happen in the book of Acts. But everything else from this point on did not happen in Acts. And we're going to see that. Therefore, this was not fulfilled. It's just like today. We're seeing the beginnings of the signs of the last days. But the birth pangs take off like I said, use the word again exponentially during the seven year tribulation and those lead up to the second coming. But we're starting to see that now. And so the same way in the book of Acts, they saw the initial pouring out of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. But listen folks, by the time the book of Acts closes and through the last few years of Paul's life, he had no longer was he demonstrating the apostolic signs. He left um, a, a friend uh, in Miletus sick because the apostolic signs were the signs of Joel, being, the Spirit being poured out on the children of Israel, the Jews. We're going to see in our next chapter that the, this pouring out of the Spirit is specifically, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but it's going to be in Revelation chapter 7. Well, didn't jump too far ahead of myself. That refers to the 144,000 that we're going to study. The 144,000 or 12,000 from the 12 tribes. Those are the sons and daughters that he's talking about. You and I aren't sons and daughters in the context of Scripture. When Joel's talking about sons and daughters, he's talking about the children of Abraham. Amen. The physical seed of Abraham. We are sons and daughters by faith and adoption. But Joel 2 is talking about the actual uh, children of Israel, the house of Israel. And so, um, again, that will happen during the 70th week. And then, as described in Revelation 6 and 7, Joel 2 describes how after God pours out His Spirit on the 144,000, then He pours out His wrath. So you got a little introduction to the next few chapters in Revelation. After, Revel after this chapter, we go to Revelation 7, he He's going to choose the 144,000, 12,000 of the 12 tribes, pour out His Spirit upon them, and then they're going to go forth and preach the gospel around the world, and they will preach it around the world, and then the end comes. And the end meaning God's wrath. And it's a few years, uh, three and a half years of intense judgment that's poured out. And that's what will happen then. And that's what's described then in Joel 2, 30 and 31. Joel 2, 30 and 31, read that with me. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. That didn't happen in the book of Acts. So we know that when Peter said, this is that which Joel spoke of, he's saying this is the beginnings of what Joel spoke of. If you turn to your Messiah that you crucified, then this will happen. But they didn't, so it didn't, and it hasn't, but it will. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now, it just so happens that Jesus, and I should say other prophets, foretold of these same events in the last days. How many of you have seen the August um, Persides? Is that how it's pronounced? The uh, meteor shower? Uh, we went a couple years 
I go down into uh, Hawking where it's nice and dark. We all have this light pollution here. It's hard to see what's going on up there. Um, but we're out in the middle of nowhere in Hawking. Black, just blackness. And then all of a sudden, all these wild, I'd never seen anything like that. I've seen what they call shooting star, you know, a meteor. I've seen that a couple times in my life. Um, the first time I'd seen anything close to that, I, I didn't realize, I didn't know anything. And, you know, what was that word, ignorant? <laughs> uh, I, I was ignorant of what all this is. We're driving down the road one day in the middle of August. It's, well, it's around August 12th. <laughs> Every year, but I didn't know this. And I'm just kind of sitting there with my head, and all of a sudden, I'm like, what in the world is going on? You know, that's the end of the world, man. I mean, it looks wild. If you've never seen that, put a little uh, reminder in your smartphone. August 12th to 14th, I think, is the every year. And you go somewhere like Hocking Hills and just about uh, between midnight and 4 in the morning. I mean, it's just amazing. And uh, the higher elevation and the darker it is, the, the greater the show. But if you don't know what's going on <laughs> and you start seeing this and these, these things fly through these big fireballs and they're like, you know, and then they blow. They don't make a lot of noise. But every once in a while, you can kind of hear a, you know, and it's just amazing to see. Well, you know, that is a taste of what we're talking about here. That is a taste, but it'll be things that we don't know about. These will be things that we don't realize. Uh, Isaiah 13 describes this. Um, Isaiah 13, 9 and 10, he says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. Now you need to learn that phrase, the day of the Lord, that specifically is talking about the wrath of God poured out, but it also includes the kingdom age. And the kingdom age ends with one last judgment of the day of the Lord. But the day of the Lord, most of the time when you're reading about it, it's talking about the, the uh, great tribulation period. And Isaiah says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. Listen, there's songs, sermons, books, all kinds of things where they talk about the day of the Lord like it's some awesome thing. Oh, I can't wait for the day of the Lord. <laughs> you have no idea what you're talking about. You better not be here for that. Amen? Yes. We want to be raptured and it's not just that we want to be. The Bible says God's not going to pour His wrath out on us. We have not a bit appointed to wrath. Thank God for it. Because the more you read about the day of the Lord, you find out you don't want to be here for it. He continues in verse 10 and describes it. He says, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. Don't let anybody talk you out of believing that. Most teachers today will try to tell you, well, that's figurative. Oh, it's just going to be really cloudy. <laughs> You're just not... <laughs> He's just not going to see. It doesn't say it's going to be blocked from view. It says that they won't give out their light. Something big is going to happen. Amen? It says the sun will, shall be darkened in his going forth. See, it's not the clouds in our atmosphere, it says it's in his going forth. Saying it's the sun itself. It's going to be darkened. The moon shall not cause her light to shine. Of course, we know the, the, the moon shines from the sun. And that is exactly what's going to happen. Don't let anybody talk you out of it. You remember Jesus said in Luke 21, 25, and there should be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. I want to show you this. These are the kind of things that uh, you see every once in a while. And, uh, it's very bright. That's a cop just sitting out in the, in the, doing his thing one night, and that's what he looks up in the sky and sees. Nice flashes. Oh, wow. No. It's out lower right, lower right. Now imagine sitting there eating your donut in your cop car. <laughs> and that's what you see. I think that goes poof at some point. No, nope, then. See, that was the thing. That was the one where they said, you know, the thing about that was it looked like a meteor and everything, but that little one little 
thing just kept going and wasn't burning up. Now, what is that? I'm not saying it's happened right now, but I know it's going to happen. Jesus said he saw Satan fall like lightning. And he is going to, with his tail during the tribulation in Revelation 12, we'll see, bring a third of the stars of heaven in the context as angels to earth with him. And the world is going to think it's an alien invasion. And we've, we have a message on audio. It's, I don't know, 30,000 some downloads of that thing where we teach that. And we'll have to do it again sometime, get it on video. Is yeah. that also, there's something in Revelation that talks about wormwood. Is that the same thing? As That's one of the things. I mean, there's several specific references to but something coming out of the sky, looks like a meteor or that's, something. That's separate from Satan falling from heaven. Yeah, when it says Satan, it's Satan. When it says the dragon, it's Satan. When it says wormwood, that's, that's something else. I now, I mean, it could be a fallen angel named wormwood, but the effects of this seem to be something other than that because it makes the waters bitter and all that. But it, and it never speaks of wormwood like it does the dragon. It never speaks of wormwood in, as a, in, a, in, a, in a, an animate manner as though it's living, see? So that's why I, I don't teach that it is an angel. I can't say I know for sure it's not. But in uh, Isaiah 30, if you turn to Isaiah 13, turn over a few pages to Isaiah 30. And again, this is something that people try to talk you out of. <laughs> but um, Isaiah chapter 30, and beginning in verse 26, it says... More, moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun. You go, wait a minute. What? <laughs> I mean, at some point, the moon's not going to shine at all. And remember, this isn't always in chronological order, and, it, and we don't have time to get into all the context, but this happens sometime before the sun is darkened and the moon is dark. Before that, this happens, and the moon shall be as the light of the sun. Why? Well, the rest of it says, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold. So the sun will burn with heat and light seven times stronger than it does now. And the moon, because of that, will burn like the sun. And do you remember there's a point in the book of Revelation where it talks about men being scorched with heat? Mm -hmm. It goes on to say, in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of His people. That's the point of the tribulation period. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. When they're in Petra. In Petra, that's right. Protected probably by about the only thing that can protect you is a bunch of uh, thick stone. And it says, Healeth the stroke of their wound. Verse 27, Behold, the name of the Lord cometh from far burning with his anger, and the burden thereof is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, and his tongue as a devouring fire. The little baby Jesus isn't coming as a baby next time, is he? There's all this stuff about the little baby Jesus today. Isn't that something? Everybody wants... It's like that... I didn't watch the movie because I heard it was pretty raunchy, but that Talladega Nights where that uh, Will Ferrell was praying, and he says, I like to pray to the baby Jesus. And they said, you know, well, he grew up. He's not a baby anymore. And Well, that's the way a lot of people are. They don't want the grown-up Jesus. I like to say what they've tried to do is turn Jesus into this hippie fruitcake. And the hippie fruitcake Jesus that you see in today isn't the biblical Jesus. The Jesus that doesn't judge, the, de the Jesus who would not condemn is not the biblical Jesus. He stands today, well, he's sitting at the right hand of God, but I think he's about to stand. <laughs> yeah. And when he stands, it's to go forth and bring us back with him. Mm -hmm. And then he pours out his wrath. This is the wrath of the Lamb, folks. I talked about that in a couple messages already on this, but the Lamb is not just, the, oh, the Lamb had died for the sins of the world. Yeah, and that Lamb is going to pour out wrath. And at the end of that seven-year period, he's going to kill about a billion people. 
That's that friendly, fluffy little Jesus that no one ever wants to think would ever do anything to hurt anybody. Listen, he wouldn't do anything to hurt any of his children. But if you're not his child, you're his enemy. Amen. Now that's what you won't hear preached today, but that's what God's Word says. You're either one of his children or you're of your father the devil. And if you're of your father the devil, then you are an enemy no less than the devil himself. Amen. And that's what this is about. And that's why he is full of indignation. His tongue... Hey, listen, if you don't love this Jesus, you don't love Jesus. Amen. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You better fall in love with the real Jesus. There's only one. You don't get to you know, pick and choose. It's not multiple choice. He's not Mr. Potato Head where you can put the parts on you like... You either take Him as He is or you don't take Him as all, at all. Amen? Amen? And that's what people are trying to do today. Now, Brother Noah uh, said this. He said, We read in Isaiah 13.10 that in the day of the Lord the sun will become dark and the moon likewise. But in Isaiah 30.26 we read that the sun will become seven times hotter and the light from the moon is the light of the sun, as I mentioned. He says the same solar and lunar phenomena in the tribulation is declared in the second chapter of Joel. I want to mention this because this is what happens. My notes are finished. And I pick up Noah's book and that's what he says. Bible believers, we don't need a denomination, we don't need a head, we don't need a pope, we've got the Holy Ghost, He teaches us the same book and we all land on the same page when we rightly divide it and we believe it. Yes, My notes are finished. Everything you already heard me say, and I picked that up, and he said the same thing. He says, Jesus said that uh, the close, typo, of the tribulation, the sun would become dark and the moon would not give light. We read also under the trumpet and bowl judgments in Revelation that the sun will become hot, then dark, and the light from the moon will be as blood. Now, Jesus said this in Luke 21, 11, Fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. Listen, I'm just telling you, turn off the boob tube. There is too much going on today to be wasting your time with television. I mean, I watch television, but I don't watch cable TV. I don't watch the network garbage. What I watch is this happening before our eyes. And most people are walking around like zombies. They have no idea what's going on today. You talk to them about this stuff. Have you seen what's going on with the sun in the last six months? Mm -hmm. The sun has been popping. And there's been warnings coming out from totally secularist, non-Christian scientists warning that there's something going on with the sun. <clears throat> They're warning people about, you think an EMP bomb from Ahmadinejad in Iran would knock things out. You get a nice buzz from the sun, that's you'd knock you back into the 19th century. That's right. And that's what they're warning about. Now, oh, I want to show you this before we get to this other quote. This is what we're going to see described in just a minute. But the sun... According to what we're reading in the Scriptures, it's going to burn seven times brighter, which is going to cause the moon... What? You can't see? My big head in the way? And Isn't that the, kind of wrong? I mean, isn't it supposed to be the Earth standing still and everything else revolving around the Earth? That's another issue. I'm not going to get the <laughs> geocentrist thing. But, um, but when it grows seven times larger, or I'm not even saying it's growing seven times, just burning seven times brighter, the moon is going to burn like the sun. Now, that then would tend to lead you to believe that it's what we call a nova. Right. Which would lead you to where Peter goes when he says that the elements will burn or melt with fervent heat. Now, that's going to that, it may sound complicated to say, well, that means everything's going to be destroyed. No, at that point is when Jesus Christ has entered into this world again and everything becomes spirit. Yes. And so everything that's not spirit melts. 
and we enter a new era.